Thank you for joining the Harvard Kennedy School Student Policy Review, Professor Allison. Thank you for having me. Uh, studying the rise of China vis-à-vis -vis the U.S., you draw from similar past instances. It was, you say, the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made their war inevitable. You have called this dynamic the Thucydides trap. Do you think U.S. and China are heading towards a Thucydides trap today? And if so, what steps can leaders on both sides take to avoid this trap? A big question. Let me try to give a brief answer. So first, uh, Thucydides' trap was a big idea that was discovered by Thucydides. So uh, Thucydides is the person who wrote about Athens and Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. This was a big insight about a dynamic in history. What I did in my book, Destined for War, was to remind people of Thucydides' big insight and to then ask whether, if we look at recent history, and in the book I review the last 500 years, we've seen this pattern uh, uh, repeated. And lo and behold, in the last 500 years, we've seen 16, one six, uh, uh, versions in, of a world in which a rapidly rising power seriously threatened to disrupt a ruling power. Twelve of these cases ended in war, four of these cases in no war. So uh, I tried to understand or try to help us understand what's happening in the current relationship between the U.S. and China by locating it on this broader historical canvas. And on this broader historical canvas, uh, three quarters of the cases have turned out to end in wars often wars that neither of the principal contenders wanted. So it seems to me that the right conclusion from this in simply trying to apply history is to recognize that the dynamics that Thucydides described in the rivalry between Athens and Sparta and that we saw vividly in the rivalry between a rising Germany and Great Britain or indeed that we saw in the rivalry between the Soviet Union and the U.S., most often is in war. And I conclude from that that if we accept business as usual or statecraft as usual, then we should expect history as usual. But we shouldn't be fatalistic about this. By looking at the record, we can see that there are instances in which, despite all these dynamics, states manage not to have great wars. And from those cases, as well as from the failures, we can learn a lot of lessons. So history can teach us lessons to avoid a U.S.-China conflict. Exactly. And in the book, uh, I have a chapter at the conclusion uh, called 12 Clues for peace, which look at the cases both of failures and of successes and say, can we learn from this history any clue that should be valuable for statesmen trying to manage a rivalry between the U.S. and China without war? Thank you, Professor. So you applied history in order to give valuable insights for the present. Exactly. So again, Thucydides is the source of this since he was the founder and father of history. He wrote the first ever history book. It was called The History of the Peloponnesian War. And in it, he says famously that we should expect the future, that as long as human beings are human beings, the future will resemble the past more or less. Okay? I think that's a general good uh, proposition. And that's actually the foundation of the concept of applied history. If the future will more or less resemble the past, then we should try to understand the past and its dynamics. And then we should analyze what's special about the current situation, because never, as Henry Kissinger points out, history is not a cookbook. It's not like a you pull it out and if you put three eggs and this and whatever, you get a souffle. Uh, you have 
instead in history to try to analyze and identify the relevant or salient similarities and differences that provide clues that may be applicable to the current situation. Thank you, Professor. So let's move on to the diplomatic field. Uh, President Xi's diplomacy and U.S. characterization of both China and Russia as enemies has produced what you have called the most significant non-declared alliance in the world. What does this alliance imply for the U.S.? Well, that's an interesting question. So, uh, the idea that China and Russia should be uh, the, should have formed the most significant most consequential non-declared alliance in the world is hard to believe. Indeed, it's unnatural. There, every reason of history should lead Russia and China to be adversaries. They have a long border with a lot of undisputed territory. Russia continues to occupy a lot of territory that on Chinese maps are still painted China. Vladivostok, the main Russian port, into the Pacific is still on Chinese maps, re reads with, by its Chinese name, because they imagine that someday, <clears throat> as historically they have, this will become Chinese territory. Where states have territorial disputes, that's one of the most reliable uh, motivators for adversarial relationship. Uh, most of eastern Russia, east of the Urals, is full of natural resources and empty of people. On the other side of the border, the low, one of the longest borders in, in the world, is a huge number, hundreds of millions of Chinese and no natural resources. So every reason of history should lead these two to be adversaries. Therefore, appreciating the extent to which they've defied geopolitics and defied history in creating this unnatural alliance is important for us as we're trying to understand what's happened. And I would say two big factors there. First big factor has been Xi Jinping with his brilliant diplomacy, which has been extremely difficult because Russia had been the senior partner and now it's having to accommodate to a junior partner. Putin is not the easiest person in the world to deal with and with his ego and otherwise. But from the first day he became president, Xi Jinping has been building this relationship. It's now a good, tight, personal relationship in which Putin calls Xi his best buddy. They celebrate their birthdays together. They've had more than 50 one-on-one -on -one meetings, which is more than twice as many as the U.S. president met with anybody. So they talk to each other regularly. So basically, there they built a, a great relationship. And uh, secondly, uh, as Spig Brzezinski, the former National Security Advisor for Carter, pointed out at the last years of his life, there's kind of an, uh, an alignment, of, he called it an alignment of the aggrieved. And he believed that the U.S. was at fault for encouraging this. So the U.S. basically ostracized both China as an adversary and Russia, Putin's Russia, as an adversary. One of the axioms of geopolitics is the enemy of my enemy is probably friendly. So as Kissinger had in the trilateral diplomacy that widened the crack between the Soviet Union and China and contributed to um, ultimately success in the Cold War, she has managed uh, in the relation, has managed his version of trilateral diplomacy in tightening the relationship with Russia in which then China is closer to Russia than the U.S. is. That's interesting. So let's move on to internal U.S. politics. The U.S. has been the predominant power of the globe for more than seven decades now. For many Americans, being number one is part of their nation's identity. At the same time, though, China's Confucian tradition, where harmony comes from hierarchy, implies that China's place in this hierarchy is at the top. 
So are these incompatible? So in one word, yes, okay. Uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew said famously that the 21st century would be a contest for supremacy in the Pacific. And I think that's basically right. Uh, that uh, uh, the U.S. imagines that having been the predominant power in Asia, let's just take Asia to start with, uh, since the Battle of Midway and since after World War II, and having created a degree of international order or stability in Asia that's allowed, uh, enabled the Asian countries to have the fastest periods of growth and increasing their well-being ever in their history. That this is a good thing, that the U.S. has played a crucial role in it, that the U.S. as a Pacific power with also territory in Hawaii, a state, and in Guam, which is a territory, uh, has played this role and will want to sustain this role. From a Chinese perspective, as I try to explain in Destined for War, this seems, uh, even for Chinese who say, well, I accept the fact that the U.S. played this role for the first seven decades after World War II, but that was then, and that was now. And now that China has become bigger and stronger and more capable, from a Chinese perspective, the idea that the U.S. Navy should be the principal arbiter of events in China's peripheral seas seems unnatural, unreasonable. Why should the U.S. have a say about how the territorial dispute between China and Taiwan, which it regards as a errant part of its uh, territory, why should the U.S. be an arbiter of that event? Well, China is not the arbiter of events in the Caribbean. China is not an arbiter of events between the U.S. and Alaska or the Aleutian Islands. So from their perspective, that was then and this is now. So from Xi Jinping's perspective, uh, in the same way that Britain had been a predominant power in the Atlantic and even up to American shores for most of the 19th century, when in the 20th century, the U.S. rose to become more powerful. Basically, the tide that had brought, brought Great Britain to America's shores receded, and with it, the British Navy. So from Xi Jinping's perspective, or the PLAs, the U.S. should do likewise and should recede from the Pacific. But from an American point of view, the U.S. is a Pacific power. It has alliances with Japan and South Korea and Australia. It believes it's built an order that's been good for everybody in the region, and it's not planning on vacating it lately or soon. So therefore, this is a contest for supremacy in the first instance in the Pacific for as far as we can see. And let's see how this will unfold. So moving on to internal uh, US policy and more specifically economics. How long can the world's greatest debtor remain the world's greatest power? What does history teach us about the consequences of an accelerating U.S. debt? It's a good question. So I have not studied this uh, uh, like I've studied the geopolitics of the rival relationship. But Ray Dalio, who runs, who built, Edge, who built uh, uh, Bridgewater, has done. And his argument is that uh, debtor countries, even debtor countries that have the, uh, uh, the, the primary currency in the world, uh, basically are living on board of time. And as the U.S. debt has grown very rapidly over the period since the year 2000 and continues on a trajectory to grow rapidly, that certainly puts in jeopardy the U.S. Posi the position of the dollar as the global currency and also the position of the U.S. as a, uh, a, a, a ability to project itself not just uh, at home but in the world. 
Yes. So, with regards to U.S. grant strategy now, do you think that the country today is in irreversible decline? And what are the U.S. strengths and weaknesses? So, the Xi Jinping narrative is that China is inexorably rising and the U.S. irreversibly declining. And you can tell a story that goes in that way for sure. If you, <coughs> excuse me, look at the performance of the U.S. in the 20th century, uh, it doesn't look very good, okay? Uh, so if you project that out to 2024 and a very contested election, maybe a return of Trump, uh, if you said write me a, a scenario for the rapid decline of the U.S. as the principal power in global politics, that's a pretty easy assignment. On the other hand, uh, history would show that uh, the U.S. has shown more than almost any other country a remarkable capacity for renewal and revival. And the story of American decline is one that we have read repeatedly over the course of American history, often in exaggerated ways. So Lee Kuan Yew, again, if I go back to uh, his wisdom on this topic, he said he was absolutely fascinated by the U.S. because it had this, he called it a unique capa capacity to screw things up to a fairly well to the point of catastrophe and collapse. And then somehow out of the ashes, Phoenix rises stronger and more capable. So in the Revolutionary War, the U.S. lost every battle until we ultimately won. In World War I, we almost didn't show up. In World War II, it was virtually over in Europe before the U.S. came to the rescue. Great Britain was just barely, barely hanging on. In the Great Depression, the U.S. was on the verge of even what would have been a fascist government of the sorts that emerged in Europe. In the Civil War, the U.S. country actually broke down into two fighting groups in which more Americans were killed than in all the other wars. So over and over, the U.S. has sort of come to the edge of disaster without actually uh, collapsing. And I don't think that's a grounds for taking, for being complacent about that some magical factor is going to come, but I think it is at least a basis for having some uh, hope. Uh, Warren Buffett, the world's most successful investor, has a good line that he often repeats. He says, uh, no one has ever made money in the long run by selling the U.S. short. That's an interesting thought. And so we have the American Phoenix against the Chinese dragon. And let's again focus on long term, as you said. So the West believes that the more liberty-oriented, open, democratic political system will perform better on the long run. Uh, on the other hand, President Xi says that things are too chaotic, the world needs order, and you can't just let people decide. Which system do you think the arc of history will bend towards? That's a great question. So, uh, the metaphor of the arc of history is one that Americans like. Uh, President Obama or Martin Luther King, you know, argued the arc of history, uh, you know, reaches towards freedom and liberty. <coughs> and there's no question that there are structural factors and forces that play an important role in shaping the future. On the other hand, I'm uh, equally impressed that human beings, their agency, leaders, uh, impact these structural factors in such a way that an arc that's going in one direction can go in another direction. So, it, let's take the uh, Great Depression in the U.S. Uh, if uh, in 1932, in the midst of the Depression, you had had a continuation of 
of the same administration we had had that brought us into the Depression, not Franklin Roosevelt. And alternatively, if Roosevelt had come to power and decided that market capitalism had failed, market democracy had failed, that he was going to be a strongman leader and basically transform the American political system, that could have happened. I think it's almost as plausibly as it happened in Germany as Hitler created a fascist regime on the basis of what had been a budding democracy or in Italy. So the combination of structural factors and human agents and leaders will end up shaping the arc of history. Now, going forward, the next 50 years, let's say, what do we make of it? Well, uh, again, I can write a scenario that says uh, human beings inherently want to be free. If I become uh, more wealthy, I come to think maybe I deserve a little more space to have my own ideas, to even exert my own preferences. Uh, so there's a powerful, I would say, force inside human beings that is captured by the Declaration of Independence that says human beings are endowed uh, uh, by their creator with the rights to life, liberty, and happiness. Now, I think that's not Americans. I think that's Chinese and Africans and everybody. Okay, So that's a real factor. On the other hand, I think it's also a real factor that technologies now um, make it possible that it may be so overwhelmingly noisy and so confusing for people that they can't distinguish between fakes and facts and in which kind of everything is a avalanche of or a, you know has a blizzard of misinformation and disinformation with few signals now in that world i can imagine that human beings will find it too difficult to function as if they can all be that free and therefore governments will have to be more authoritarian and more controlling. So I would say, you know, the future nobody knows, but I think the hope in the relationship and rivalry between the US and China is that they can each try to show which of these systems is better able to deal with the world as it exists. And as long as it's a peaceful rivalry with a peaceful coexistence, I would say wait 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And I'm hoping and believing, since it's a matter of faith for me that basically human beings really want to be free and that a liberty-centered form of government will ultimately succeed in providing more of what people want than an authoritarian system. So that's my bet. I take Xi Jinping as his word. His bet is that it's going to require a authoritarian government with a party leadership that'll be the vanguard and that will create an order that will improve human beings' lives so much that they're happy to let him drive the bus. I think that's quite possible. So I would say, play out the experiment and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And I think it's fitting to conclude this interview with this optimistic note of yours. And Good. thank you very much for your valuable insights, Professor Allison. Thank you very much.